Christians. The Western Church is, to put it mildly, going through a rethink. Since 2000, but especially since 2020, numbers are down and people are feeling the pressure and it seems like things are in crisis, like, like something is going to change. And that's leading people to rethink the assumptions they had about the basic parts of church, like how we gather together and what church should look like. Well, in this series of episodes, I want to look back at the early church and see the differences between the early church and the modern church and see if the early church has anything to tell us today about what church should look like. Today, we're discussing houses of worship. Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Worship Homestead. My name is Nathan Smith. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're talking about the early church versus the modern church, and specifically, houses of worship. But before we get there, I'd like to give you something. If you go to my website, blueprintsounds.com, you can get access to my free worship training bundle called the Worship Booster Pack. It has PDFs and online classes in everything from live sound for churches, how to build a better band, 25 chart-topping arrangement tricks, the five elements of a full-sounding worship team, and more, all on my website for free, or click on the link nearby, blueprintsounds.com forward slash worship booster pack. All right, let's talk about places of worship in the early church. So when I talk about the early church, I'm basically talking about the first three centuries. But to talk about the early church, I actually want to talk about the predecessor to the early church, and that is Judaism. Right? So Jesus was a Jew, obviously, and many times in Scripture it talks about him visiting the synagogue. As a good Jewish boy, he would have grown up going to synagogue every Sabbath. And there's that famous passage where Jesus visits the synagogue and opens the scroll and reads from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, etc., etc. So what was life like in that synagogue, and what does that tell us about how the early church would have worshipped? Because the earliest Christians were Jews. So here's what a synagogue in Jesus' day would have looked like. You walk through the front door of this rectangular-shaped building, and you have the ground level, and then around the edges of the walls you have benches, or sometimes cut out into rock, you would have stacked benches and stacked seating. But then also in the middle of the ground floor level, you have these columns that support the roof. Now, that kind of seems odd to us today. Why would you have, you know, these are pretty thick columns because everything's built out of stone and wood back in the day. You have these thick columns at ground level right where we would have put seating. And yet for the Jews, they put the seating around the edges. Well, there's some very interesting cultural reasons why they did that. The first is Israelites saw themselves as a collective. It was an Eastern culture, not a Western culture. So for them, the collective, the group came first. So men would line around the edges of the building so that they could face one another, so that they could see each other and hear one another. The other part is the columns right in the middle of the ground floor level, like you would think that's the prime real estate for a modern, you know, eye. Well, it didn't matter to the Jews because the most important thing for them was hearing and not seeing. See, Jews considered hearing to be the most important sense. If you think about the basic prayer that Jews prayed that we find in Deuteronomy, it's called the Shema, and it sounds like this. Shema Israel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. Translated, that means, hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that would have been recited at every Sabbath synagogue meeting. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And everything that happened in the synagogue was dependent upon listening, not necessarily seeing. So you would hear prayers, you would hear them read from the law, you know, the Torah, they'd read from the prophets, there might be a sermon, but there would also be discussion. And that's why the rectangular shape worked so well, is that any man in the community could have stood up and discussed something about the law or the prophets or whatever, and another person would stand up and there would be these discussions. That's, that was the point of the synagogue. Every man who was of age, part of the Jewish community, was expected to come to synagogue and be ready to participate by reading or praying or something like that. So with that as a backdrop, let's look at the earliest Christians. What would their gatherings have looked like? Well, they usually met in homes, although not exclusively. They met in a lot of different places, but oftentimes it was in the home. Well, what do you do in a living room? People don't just get in the middle. 
Oftentimes, you're going to line the outside edges, just like you would in a synagogue, so that everybody sort of forms a loose circle and that you can look at each other. And then what did people do at church, you know, in the early, early days? Well, Paul explains all of the different things that they might do. He says, when you get together, brothers, one of you has a teaching, one of you has a revelation, one of you has a tongue, one has the interpretation of a tongue. There's all of these things that they would have done, but they were doing it in a circle facing one another for one another. They were ministering to each other. And it was expected of them, just like a Jewish man in a synagogue, that any one of them at any point might be either called upon or might volunteer to participate in the proceedings. There wasn't really a set liturgy at that time. It was, hey, what do we feel like God is doing next? So then somebody stands up and participates. That all would have made perfect sense to them within the context of the synagogue. Hey, this is what we did in the synagogue. This is what we're going to do here in the home as new Christians. And this isn't just for Jews. Anybody can do it. But Greeks, Romans would have come into this setting and it would have been, hey, we're all ready to go. We could at any point, any of us share a teaching, a revelation, a scripture, a song, a tongue, any of that. It was very free form. So the leader, rather than dictating the order of events, was more like a facilitator, helping, you know, people go one at a time, just like Paul talks about in Corinthians. But that's the structure because the space allowed for that. So let's set all that to the side and look at how we got to the modern church. The modern church doesn't look like that at all. Where does that come from? Well, that is a Greek thing. So, like I said, the Jews, we think of them as people of the ear. Hearing was the main thing for them. Well, for Greeks, seeing was the main thing. And you can kind of tell in, the, in what remains of their culture. When we think about Greek culture, what do we think of? The Parthenon. We think of architecture. We think of uh, sculpture. We think of vases. We think of um, theater. They gave the world theater. We think of science because science is all about observing the natural world with your eye. So all of that is a Greek value. For them, the eye, what you can see, is the thing that matters. And so as a result, that works its way into their architecture. The amphitheater is a Greek invention. Well, what is that? That's a stage, and then it's usually, you know, placed next to a hill, and then into the hill they cut out stacked seating that radiates outward like a clamshell, so that everybody who comes can see the main person, whoever that is. That could be the actors on stage, that could be the public speaker, maybe it's a government function, you know, for voting. Whatever it is, the majority is looking at the minority, because the Greeks are also the basis of humanism. And humanism uses man as the measure for all things. And that's a very Greco-Roman idea. The Jews, by contrast, used God as the measure for all things. Because remember, when, when the Jews think about their history and, and how it all panned out, they were chosen. They didn't choose God. God chose Abraham. He called Abram out of Ur and said, I'm going to make a new people out of you. God showed up to Moses as a burning bush. He came on Mount Sinai and gave the people the law. So for the Jews, that morality, the, the you know, everything that we have in the law is received from God. He is the measure of all things, and he tells men how to live. Well, the Greco-Romans did not think like that at all. Their Hellenistic mindset put man as the measure of all things. They were always thinking about what would the ideal man or the ideal woman be like, which is why their sculpture was so good, because they were looking for the ideal male, or why they gave us the Olympics, because they're thinking, all right, we need the ideal man, the perfect runner, the perfect discus thrower, the perfect wrestler or boxer. That's what we're going to elevate and exalt is the human form in its best form. And that, again, is why we have amphitheaters which focus all of the attention on one or a few men. So what does that have to do with the church? Well, you probably know that for the first couple centuries, the church was heavily persecuted by Rome because it was so weird to them. Culturally, Romans found Christians so weird that 
that they just couldn't stomach them. They they were really, really suspicious of Christians. That is, until Emperor Constantine came around. Emperor Constantine famously got converted to Christianity. We'll never know to what degree he was converted to Christianity. Some people, I happen to agree, believe that he did it for political reasons to help, you know, bring his empire together, and he saw Christianity as a way to do that, to bring everybody together under one religion. Whatever we think about that, one thing we know for sure is that he definitely changed Christianity into a Greco-Roman image. And one of the ways that he did this was by changing the shape of the church. So he adopted the shape of the basilica. The basilica, we think of St. Peter's Basilica, is actually a Roman design. It's this long rectangular building with aisles and seating, you know, facing forward. And then at the front is this raised platform where a magistrate would come and hear cases. So it was for government functions, but it was, you know, a large gathering place for a lot of different functions. Well, he took that rectangular shape and said, that's going to be the shape for the church. So he built St. Peter's Basilica, the old one, and a lot of other churches that use that same design. And that same design remains with us today. So when you walk into a church, you're likely to see something that looks like either an amphitheater or a basilica. In either case, you're going to have a long building with rows of seating facing forward, and there will be a stage. And on that stage, the minority, the special class of people who do all the singing and talking, will be on that stage gathering the attention of everyone else. That is very, very different from the way that the early church met, and the reason why it's different is because the values of the building are different. A building has values because it's made by people who have values, and they make the church for a specific reason. Well, in a living room, the reason why you would get together is so that you can see everybody, and why the early church did that is so that they could minister to one another. Today, in the modern church with its Greco-Roman ideals, we come to church to sit in pews, to face forward, to watch one person or a few people do most of the talking and singing. In the early church, the focus was on the group identity. In the modern church, the focus is on the celebrity. This explains why the modern church has gotten so showy. Why is that? Well, we're doing what the building would like us to do, which is to put a few people on a pedestal. In the early church, just like the synagogue, the focus was on hearing what the Lord was saying. And in the early church, that could have come from any number of the people in the church. In the modern church, the focus is on hearing what the sermon or the preacher has to say because, well, we get that from Greek public speaking and Greek theater. It's all about the one person rather than the group. And here's another really interesting tidbit about the early church versus the modern church. In Roman culture, in the early church, the place for women was in the home. Men were the ones that went out. They, you know, voted. They were the ones that went to the gymnasium. They met with other men. They, they were about town. Women remained in the house. Here's the funny thing, though. When the Christian church was in its infancy and meeting in homes, that was home turf for women. That meant that women could be full participants in church gatherings because it, it wasn't weird. We were on the woman's home turf. We were in her home, right? Well, here's what happened. As the church started to grow and the numbers got bigger and they're like, well, we need, we need dedicated buildings. We need purpose-built buildings for our church to meet. Scholars believe that the role of women pulled back because, well, they were no longer on their home turf. They were no longer in a place where it was expected and normal that a woman could be participatory. Now that you're in a dedicated building, women pull back and it becomes a more male-dominated place, just like it was a male-dominated Roman society. So as the church got bigger and they got more legitimate, quote-unquote, they left part of their body of Christ behind. They left women behind. So today, when we have the big discussion, well, should women be in ministry? Should they be ordained ministers? Should that be allowed or shouldn't it? That's not the question we should be asking. The question we should be asking is, where did this idea that we had 
a pastor who was the be-all, end-all, who had control over his congregation, who everybody sat in rows facing forward watching him as if he were the man of God and he were the only one that heard from God for everybody else in the congregation, where did that idea come from? The unfortunate answer is that idea has a lot more to do with political power and architecture than it does anything in the Bible. In the Bible, the emphasis is more on group identity than it is the identity of the head pastor. Don't get me wrong, pastors exist in the Bible. I'm not saying that, but their role is not nearly as elevated as it is today. We have to look to Greek and Roman culture to get that, not what the Lord says in Scripture. Hey, I hope that episode helps you, and I hope it breaks up some assumptions that you might have had about the way that church has to be. We don't have to do it like it's always been done because it hasn't always been done like that. Again, if you need help with your worship team, go to blueprintsounds.com forward slash worship booster pack. If you're listening to the podcast, leave a good review. It helps me out. Likewise, if you're on YouTube, like and subscribe. Until next week, God bless and goodbye.